and this is Jodie. Come on, Jodie. We're going to teach you how to sit. To make a dog sit, first of all, you've got to learn the right signal and the right tone of voice. Now watch. I say it's in action two. Sit right up to the shoulder, very smartly. I'll do it again. Sit. That was the one and only Barbara Woodhouse in action on the programme that made her a household name and a national institution. Training dogs the Woodhouse way ran for only 10 weeks, but it was a phenomenal success. And as a result of it, Barbara became a major celebrity in demand for all kinds of programmes that had nothing to do with dogs. Sit and walkies became universal catchwords guaranteed to score in the most incongruous situations. Yes, Barbara Woodhouse was a star. And without doubt, she wanted fame, if only to share with the world her prodigious store of downright common sense on any number of subjects. About 25 years ago, the editor of a BBC television news programme, Town and Around, yielded to Barbara's lobbying about the almost human skills of her great Dane, Juno, and I was sent to interview the dog. Well, talking dogs is something you have to learn to deal with if you're a reporter at some time or other, even if you don't work for That's Life. But I have to say I was even more impressed with Juno's very talkative owner, even though I didn't predict stardom for her at that time. But I've subsequently learned that Barbara's bombardment of the BBC goes back even further than the early 1960s. The first letter on the BBC file goes back to 1948 when Barbara was a married woman in her thirties with three young children living and farming in Buckinghamshire. Would you like to see my cows? She was asking at that time. And she pursued that line until Woman's Hour booked her to give a talk about taking her cows on holiday. Yes, she did actually do that. In 1982, Woman's Hour were quite eager to book her during a bad outbreak of foot and mouth disease because Mrs. Woodhouse could speak from direct experience She's actually had the disease herself. She applied for a job as a radio commentator and she didn't even get an audition. But the BBC got a snorter from Mrs Woodhouse, never one to mince words. It must be very difficult to shortlist anyone without hearing them speak. And to turn any applicant down just on a letter seems very short-sighted to me, especially as you don't even know who I am. Barbara was even more persistent with television, offering pieces not only about cows, but about rural rights of way, cookery and children's clothes, as well as dog training, her most constant interest. The moral is clear. If at first you don't succeed. The indomitable spirit of Barbara Woodhouse was surely her most remarkable quality. And it certainly survived the first of several strokes as an extract from Where There's Life on Yorkshire Television shows. That's better. Do you want to go, Orchis? Do you? Oh, I always used to say my motto was, there's no such word as can't in the English dictionary. And when I say sometimes, perhaps my husband, I can't walk over there, I really can't. I should have said I won't, because it's perfectly obvious that if I really tried, I really determined to win, I could. So now I've got to cut the word can't out of my dictionary altogether and just use the word won't, which is very stubborn and very stupid. So what was Barbara Woodhouse really like? Well, those who knew her well said that she was much the same off the screen as she was on. She was a rather private person, and her love for her husband and family was fiercely protective. She didn't want them exposed to the public gaze, and we've respected that wish in this brief tribute. So what was her legacy? Well, her ideas, and some of them, one has to say, were highly controversial on the training of animals and, above all, their owners, are perpetuated in her many books. But what I think most of us will cherish is the memory of a totally individual, uncompromising person, courageous and clear-headed. And although she did have a commanding way with her, it was tempered by an exuberant sense of fun, as is clearly shown in this extract from her last television series, The Woodhouse Road Show. Oh, she's tired!
The Pie Awards, the outstanding female television personality. personality uh, the nominations are Anna Ford, Pamela Stevenson, and Barbara Woodhouse. I shan't keep you in suspense many moments. And the winner is Barbara Woodhouse. Seldom can anyone have risen to national fame as quickly as Barbara Woodhouse. Here, in June 1980, she was receiving one of the most coveted awards in British television, only six months after appearing in her first major series. Well, I'm absolutely staggered because I knew nothing about it. I thought I'd been invited to do what he's done, read out of an envelope, somebody who'd won something. What I would like to say is that if the series has done anything to make dogs more acceptable in these awful days when everybody is saying horrid things about dogs, and that dogs can be a joy to all and a nuisance to no one, I accept this lovely gift on the behalf of every dog owner. Jerk him back now. No, that's a cross. You'll try and jerk back if he's ahead. That's right, that'll stop him. That's splendid. It all started with this program, Training Dogs the Woodhouse Way. The series was a phenomenal success and not only popularised the use of her special choke chain, but turned some of her commands into national catchwords. Yes, can you say walkies in a happier voice? Walkies! Now, jerk him back, he's ahead of you. That's not nearly hard enough. And take a hand off. Otherwise it doesn't free. The nation was That's convinced right. more, that there were no such things good. as bad dogs, now, merely sit. inexperienced sit. owners. Push him down quickly. Sit! He doesn't know yet what to do. Now love him. What a good boy. A Barbara Woodhouse went on to become a cult figure, a British institution. And no matter what the programme, she almost always ended up by training the host. Walkies! Now tap your leg and go round there and come back to me. Say, walkies, don't walk. Walkies! <laughs> Barbara's meteoric rise to stardom owed much to her outgoing personality. But in another sense, it was merely the culmination of 65 years of working with animals. Barbara, you spent the first nine years of your life in a boys' public school of which your father was the headmaster. Yes, in oh. Ireland, Rathfarnham. It's the sister school. St Columbus College, it was called. It was the sister school to Radley and Glen Armand here. Yeah. They were all founded by uh, uh, St Columba, I gather. And, of course, it was ideal for, for my point of view because there was masses of animals, masses of land. They had 150 acres of farmland going into the Wicklow Mountains. It was so beautiful. And a huge park where the little deer uh, used to come up and talk to me from a very early age and of course large cart horses and cattle and everything. How early on in your life did you realise that you were devoted to animals and wanted a great number of pets? Oh, I think probably from the age of about 18 months when my uh, sister was born and uh, all I could see was a bundle of black hair and a very stiff and starchy nurse who told me to go away so I just went back to my animals. I thought they were much more interesting than a baby sister. Now, very early in your life, you were given authority over animals to a quite remarkable extent. Well, uh, we had a governess who came daily from uh, Dundrum Station, and that was five miles from the cottage and I, uh, college, and I used to drive that five miles alone at five years old with the pony trap, going like hell. I've never seen my pony go so fast with me. You know, we were really enjoying the speed. At five years old? Oh, yes. And uh, nobody minded whether really it pitched me into the ditch or anything. And occasionally when we met a steamroller or anything, the pony shied terribly badly. You must have had very restrained parents who didn't make you anxious about that kind of my exploit. My parents never came into my life at all, hardly. Uh, we were brought up in the a nursery wing with a lovely old nanny who, who made, not only saw after us, but made all our own uh, clothes and saw after us, loved animals, taught us everything we knew. Our parents only saw us between five and six in the evening when we were dressed in the starchiest of clothes, taken down to the drawing room to play games, marvellous lots of games, but I preferred nanny to my parents, quite honestly. My father had a moustache, which if he said goodnight, pricked me and I didn't like it and on Sundays he was a parson and he used to tell terrible stories of how if we lied or cheated we'd go to hellfire. Do you think it made you very independent then from such I an I was always age? independent. I was rather different from the other family. You see animals were everything to me. If there weren't any given to me or they weren't mine I went and played with other people's animals. The, uh, the big horses, one or two of them had muzzles on, they bit 
and they had great big moustaches which they waggled like that. And I used to go down and give them sugar by pushing my hand through the muzzle and giving them sugar. And I never forget Mother coming in once to the stables to find me and uh, seeing me do this. And she said, didn't you know that horse would bite? And I said, no, it wouldn't bite me. Why should it? I haven't done anything to make it bite me and I gave it more sugar. This wonderful childhood really came to an abrupt end when your father died when you were nine. Yes. And then you moved to Brighton to oh. circumstances with no animals at all. Nothing at all. But there again, I used to sit on the milkman's pony as it went up the road delivering the milk. People were awfully kind to me. They could see I was a child who absolutely adored animals. I hated school, every minute of it. Oh, I was you? always stupid. My uh, reports always said Barbara will only work if the subject interests her. Well, of course, the subject didn't interest me. The only thing that interested me was botany and languages. I adore languages. My mother spoke six languages, including Russian. And even now, I've never... That's the only thing in my life I've not achieved, to speak six languages. Perhaps one day I may, if I live long enough. When Barbara was 10, her family moved again, this time from Brighton to Oxford, where she went to Headington School for Girls. One of her school friends was Louise Guiney Martin. But you know, you were the most fascinating person. You were full of beans. You were always in trouble. I was always in trouble, but I had an elder sister, Nadine, here. And every time I did something awful, Nadine was called to Miss Porcher's study and scolded <laughs> for not seeing after me. I was the untidiest girl in the school to begin with. Yes, you I were projector. How many people were there here when you first came? Well, there were only 12. You had to have quite a sort of uh, references from all sorts of people to get in here uh, in the original well, way, you know. be very upper class. Uh, well, more or less, <laughs> yes. <laughs> because it was rather a snob class place. But I remember a wonderful mistress. She um, was a form mistress. I don't suppose I want to mention her name, but um, <laughs> she used to always stand teaching us with her skirts hitched right up over her shoulders by the fire. Yes, and uh, do you remember? Yes, yes. So one day in the lunch break, we built the fire. There was always a bucket of coal there. We put practically the whole bucket of coal on the fire. Yes. And as she drew her skirts up, she caught fire. And we had the most marvelous time bumping her on the ground and rolling her. Rolling her over. Oh, yes. yes. Did she recover? <laughs> she was quite a good sport, actually. Yes. I was turned out of the netball team. I was too rough. Oh, they the said netball. I was too rough. What a dreadful oh, hockey was the thing I loved. <laughs> Did you play hockey? No, I, I wasn't allowed to. My mother said it wasn't ladylike. Well, what about lacrosse? No, Locking I wasn't allowed to play that either. That was bad for our, uh, for our busts. <laughs> but much <laughs> my mother said, doing this, we'd develop a big bust, which she was probably right. Yes, I should everyone was yearning to do that, exactly. <laughs> you hadn't enjoyed school very much, Barbara, and then you went to finishing school in Switzerland. Oh, yes, that's what I really wanted to do. And my grandmother paid for it. And we chose this place in La Rosia above Lausanne, expecting a wonderful life. And when we got there, it was run by three old Herodons who uh, kept us like prisoners and starved us. They didn't give us enough food. We started work at 9.30, at 6.30 in the morning, went on till 9.30 at night. And uh, we never allowed to speak anything but French and never had any food. And uh, in the end, um, I decided to run away. So when we were all taken to the cathedral on Sunday, we got on a tram and when we arrived just outside the cathedral, all the um, girls got out one side, I got out the other and ran away. But unfortunately, I got to the frontier, but unfortunately I'd forgotten my passport. Of course, when you go to school in Switzerland, they take your passport. So I was brought home by the gendarmes. And uh, in... unfortunately, I was shut in a, a room, at least uh, it wasn't locked or anything, and I was called La Sauvage, the savage. And nobody was allowed to speak to me. I only appeared in lessons, was taken back. But I had my revenge. I saw the three old ladies go out one day, so I left my room. I went into their study. I found my passport. I rang up the consul, and I said we were all held prisoner in this school. This was about after six months, I should say, that we were all held prisoner, and I wanted to go home, and none of my letters were reaching my mother. I knew that, or she'd have rescued me. And they sent an English person up to talk to, talk to us, shut the school down, took us all home to England. And that was the end of that school. You came back to England and then you decided to go to another male institution. First the public school where you grew up and then an agricultural college for men. Yes. Well, of course, you see, I, I, I adored animals. I always wanted to farm. And I met an undergraduate uh, at Oxford who told me that his uncle was a warden at this agricultural college. So I asked him for the address. 
I didn't dare tell my mother, but I wrote them a letter entering myself. They said 16 was the age where the pupils went, you know, students went. So I wrote and entered myself for Harper Adams Agricultural College and signed her name. I, it was only later that she found out what I'd done, but it was a good thing I did because I then got in. But I was the only girl there. So that you're really something of a pioneer in trying to get part of the men's share of the educational system. Oh, I was a pioneer. There weren't many women in, in this agricultural show, but now I gather there are 300 men and 300 women. But, uh, and they treated me like gold. They really were lovely. It was great fun working with them, a lovely lot of, 60 of them. And uh, I, they helped me and I helped them. Uh, they didn't like milking cows, and I, so I took over all the milking of the cows. I used to milk 13 cows. No wonder they were nice to you. But I sent them to clean the pigs. I didn't like cleaning <laughs> pigs. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of things did you learn at Agricultural College, Barbara? Oh, everything you can possibly imagine. Besides agriculture and horticulture, we learned building construction and surveying, veterinary science, engineering. In fact, my exam in engineering was to put together a four-cylinder engine. And of course, I've always loved engines. I always tuned all my son's uh, friend's sports cars and my own car. Uh, I have tuned extremely well. You know, I can't bear anything wrong with an engine. After college, I uh, started teaching riding with one little pony that was uh, uh, called untrainable in the cattle market at Oxford and I bought for 30 shillings because it, it had had three trainers as owners and it, uh, it, it was untrainable. And uh, I took it home. I hadn't got a saddle. It was only about 12 hands. And I, my feet nearly touched the ground. And it chucked me off over its head. But the third time, I hung on with my arms round its neck and my feet round its neck. And after that, it never bucked anymore. And I thought I would start teaching riding. So I put a notice up, Sandfield Riding School, I think it was, outside the house. And my first pupil was a dear little boy called Donald Douglas. And he was two and a half. Hey, what is it? Well, it's a Welsh mountain. And um, it was one of our original driving team. But Donald Douglas has since become a well-known figure in the horse world. At his home in Sussex, he keeps horses both for showing and for the popular sport of driving. Well, we, well, we were always interested in horses and we took up driving. We were much more interested in riding, but we took up driving. Yes. Can I give him a lump of sugar, Donald? Yes, of course you may, oh. yes. You know, we always reward with sugar. Do you? And we learned that from, from the Spanish riding school. What they, they well, do? they always reward their horses. They have a, a the tailcoats, and they have a pocket in the back, and you'll see them fumble. Out comes a lump of sugar, and then it goes like that. Well, it's a long time, Donald, since you were two and a half years old, and I gave you your first riding lesson. Do you remember it at Headington, my old home? Well, I Hedington. can't remember two and a half. <laughs> well, I, I can remember I was about six. No, no, seven. that was a lot later. You rode for a long time, but you were well, two was and it a half. Always Alouette. It was always Alouette. Yes, Alouette was the pony I bought in the market for 30 bob because she couldn't be broken by other people. She chucked me off. And so I, you then put me off. I thought off. I'd put you well, on. They yes. can't. I remember those days so well. You know. I remember going to Sandfield, your home, and uh, yes. your mother being my, my scoutmaster. She, oh, she, she, when I was a boy day. cub, yes, yeah. she taught me reef knots and bowlings. I'd never got into the Navy without her assistance. <laughs> <laughs> what days those were, but how you've progressed in the horse world, haven't you? By 1936, Barbara's riding school in Oxford was becoming very popular, and she soon had 17 horses. But although Barbara did all the work, cleaning the stables and the tack, there was still time for other activities, such as playing polo. And in the evenings, she and her sister even ran a school for ballroom dancing. You really were a hard worker, weren't you? I always have been. I like it. I like working. Mother taught us never to sit down before six o'clock in the evening, and now I can't sit down. If I sit down, I think of something to do. Come on, Bill. Come on, love. He's a show horse in the hunter classes, aren't you, dear? Hmm? So when you uh, got rid of your riding school, did you miss it? Oh, I went to the Argentine. It was in the Argentine that you learnt the, the breathing up the nostril tree. Yes, well that of course was taught by a Guarani Indian who um, uh, told me when I was breaking a horse, asked me what I was doing and I told him breaking. He said, do you want to know uh, our method of breaking? And I said, yes. And he said, well put your hands behind your back and breathe up the horse's nose and it'll be your friend for life. It isn't for a broken horse, it's for an unbroken, a wild one. It completely tames them. And now, why is that? Is it a well, form it's of how breeding? how you do in, in animal language, some animal language, not even the horses and uh, hyenas and bison, apparently, cattle and llamas. And it's their, their method of saying, how do you do? I suppose they like the, uh, the feeling of your breath, a nice warm breath. <laughs> Uh, 
I'd always been mad on horses, you know, from the day I was born, I think. I, I always wrote in, in a book that I think I ought to have been born in a stable. And uh, the Argentine, of course, were 6,000 horses on that estancia, wild horses. When I went there, I wasn't allowed to break in horses at all. They said women don't do this thing. Always women. Women couldn't do this. Women couldn't do that. They couldn't seem to do anything as far as I could see. And uh, when the manager was out one day, I bribed one of the peons, that's cowboy in, in Spanish, to uh, catch me a wild horse, which I broke in about a couple of hours. And when the manager came home, he was furious. But I got him to ride it, and he said how beautifully it went. And then the inspector came up from the, of the meat company he was with, and I let him ride it, and he gave me the job at 10 shillings a head of breaking the horses. Now, that's quite a daring thing to take on a wild horse. No, nothing's daring yes, with it animals. Is. I no, can't, I animals can't don't do not. you any harm. But you must be simpatico, as they say in Spanish, because if you're at all frightened, the horse will pick up your, your fear. There's nothing so devastating to animals as fear, because you're sending out adrenaline in your body, and animals can smell adrenaline any time. And uh, if you're frightened of an animal, you'll probably get chucked off or bitten or something. I've, I've no fear of any animal, you see. And I've never in my life been chucked off by an unbroken horse, but I've been chucked off many times by a, a vicious and unbroken horse. You know, that's not broken badly, I mean, not unbroken, but broken badly by somebody else. But that must be very daunting to be injured when you're thrown from a horse. I was dragged a mile by a horse that in the Argentine that the inspector asked me to ride. He just had it, been breaking it in and it was thoroughly wicked. And uh, it suddenly started bucking after I was racing after the company's dog that was chasing the sheep. I, I leant forward to gallop fast, put its head between its legs and gave about 40 really rodeo bucks. I was chucked off, but I held on to the reins and I was dragged for over a mile. And I completely scalped my head. I hadn't got any hair or any skin left on the top of my head at all. Very resolute of you to survive something like that. Well, that was the first time in my life I was frightened to get on a horse for a few days. I really lost my nerve for a few minutes. It was the most devastating experience because I was a long way from help. If I had been knocked out, nobody would have found me for a long time in the pampas. Well, those huge estancias out in the Argentine, I mean, it must have been an extraordinary life. It's so far away from home. A hundred miles from one's nearest neighbour, you know. Very lonely, but uh, fascinating. Did you feel lonely at all? Did you miss oh, yes. home, family, yes, friends? Yes, of course I was, but I wasn't going to admit it. I mean, my mother told me I couldn't possibly go 6,000 miles and do that sort of thing, and I wasn't going to come home and tell her I could. Couldn't, was I? Can't be defeated in this world, you know. <laughs> In 1939, in Oxford, Barbara met a young, newly qualified doctor, Michael Woodhouse. When you first met Barbara Blackburn, as she then was, what impression did she make on you? Oh, she was absolutely full of energy. She was really rushing around everywhere, and, and she was also very beautiful. And you felt happy victim, <laughs> you? Oh, very happy indeed. <laughs> <laughs> now, you married just at the beginning of the war, yes. and then you moved because you had to become a GP's wife at that time. Now, yes. what was the prospect of that like, Barbara? Well, you see, I went with all good intentions, what a good GP's wife should be, but uh, the place we were sent to in Wiltshire, I had the most, we all both had the most extraordinary reception. I mean, they treated us as foreigners. I was in a fish shop one day, and I, he, I said something to a man politely, and he answered me quite rudely. And I said, why are you so rude to me? You don't know me. He said, I always treat foreigners with suspicion till I get to know them. But I said, I'm your doctor's wife. It don't matter. You be a foreigner. And it was as a young doctor's wife that you had the idea of keeping a cow. Well, you see, the milk in the town was absolutely filthy, and I had, having been a government milk tester in my college days, I knew dirty milk when I saw it. So I bought a Guernsey from Cornwall, actually, to be a house cow, and kept it in our garage. And uh, then, of course, everybody uh, rather liked the idea of having my milk. So eventually, with other people's old stables and an old shed under the army barracks, I uh, bought cows, and uh, I supplied the whole town after a lot of quarrels with the council, they wouldn't let me do it. They said, throw your milk down the drain. When I said, what should I do with the milk? They wouldn't give me a license to, to uh, retail milk. Pretty unconventional way for a GP's wife to <laughs> behave, isn't it? Yes, it was a bit of